So before you can send your questions and we start the conversation, we have a question for you, the audience, which you can answer on menti.com, typing the code that will appear on the screen. Okay, so the question is, which area do you think artificial intelligence will transform the most? Employment, health, mobility, new areas, public policy, or other areas? <laughs> Direct to the mark. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. And uh, so while we went, we wait for the result, uh, which would be your answer to this question? I think health is starting to get an early lead. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah, so it looks like health is starting to get an, an early lead. I guess the, the people can see this on the screen at home, no? Yes. 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 Yeah. So you know, it's up to nine now. What, what do you think? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was just wondering about that question because imagine that when electricity became available for many, we would have polled the people at that time, you know, what do you think electricity will transform the most? Would have been very hard to predict. And in fact, even in hindsight, right now, if you ask me what electricity transformed the most, I'm not even able to answer that. And I think AI is comparable to electricity in the kind of transformation it's going to, it's going to allow. So yeah, I'm not going to make any bets here. <laughs> So we have a question by, by Fabio Montero. Uh, he says, uh, over the past few years, we have been observing a lot of changes in the global scene disrupting supply chains. How can AI contribute to mitigate these issues and help us optimize supply chain management? So that's true. I, I remember like a, a few years ago, and I did a project for Steelcase. For those of you who might not know, Steelcase are the number one manufacturer of furniture, office furniture in the United States, okay? So they're based in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they manufacture like the office furniture that you will see all over the US. Actually, most of it comes from them. And they have just-in-time manufacturing. You know, so if you guys are not familiar with the idea of just-in-time manufacturing is that a steel case doesn't start manufacturing anything until after they sell something, okay? So you order a chair, and after you order a chair, they start manufacturing the chair. So this is people that, of course, have been in the area of Michigan for a long time, their life has been supply chains. You know, Michigan has been a supply chain intensive economy for a long time is the, is the car economy and so forth. And they have, you know, this just-in-time manufacturing, you know, and what they worry the most about is about like what they call a splits, which is, you know, you put an order and if the order doesn't leave all in the same shipment, they lose money. If the order is able to leave all in the same shipment, that's how they make a profit, you know? So it's all about that logistics, you know, it's not about the materials, it's not about any of those things. And this type of just-in-time manufacturing got severely disrupted, you know, uh, during COVID, you know, and during all of the traffic jumps that we've seen in ports over uh, the recent years. Now, even uh, in their case, that they are a very advanced logistic company, at that moment, they had big information problems about being able to foresee, you know, um, constraints in their supply chain that would emerge when they would have unusually large orders of an item that was not very commonly you know, ordered because the problem is that they're able to know their supply chain, but they would not know uh, like constraints that might happen two or uh, three links you know, upstream from them, okay? So they might order certain pieces from China, they usually arrive in time, but that's because they're ordering 10, 20 at a time. If they put an order of 500, all of a sudden, they're not gonna be able to send them, not because 
they cannot, but because that person also has other suppliers that then become constrained to provide some of the inputs and so forth. So in that world, you could think, you know, that given enough data of the history of the supply chains, you might start training those models to be able to provide alerts when that purchase is going to happen that triggers, you know, that these are purchases that maybe we're not gonna be able to fulfill, that's gonna uh, cause a delay of the factory, you know, and that information can also be then sent to the people that eventually, you know, their lives are gonna become hell two or three weeks down the line when they have to deliver the order and they cannot do it. So I think that's one place where AI, I think, can support, like supply chain business is a, is a data intensive business. You know, SAP, the biggest software company in, in, in Germany, I think maybe in mm -hmm. Europe, you know, is, you know, on the supply chain business. But I think that other places, and just to give you like a brief idea, like we are working in my group with the um, NIST in the United States, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, in part because despite the fact that supply chains are so important, we have very limited data about them at a global scale. Everybody knows their own thing. And we're using machine learning, you know, on international trade data to try to infer supply chains so that we can provide these maps that we can use to strategize and be resilient you know we can strategize when a natural disaster happens when you know a shipping route gets interrupted you know what are the other places that can provide what we need and that we could pivot towards well you know to make those strategic decisions you need to have those maps and i think with ai and with the data that we have we can start building those maps thank you so I guess so we have another question. So the other question is, uh, what would be the approximate time years for artificial intelligence based public utilities to reach economies of scale where developing countries could also make use of them for, op for optimal standard of living for the masses at large? So, Cesar, maybe you well, want to. The question is, when will utopia happen? I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> you know? uh, but I don't think a utopia is a bad idea, not because it might come true, but because you want to know where you want to go. Yeah. And in some sense, you know, like what utopia means changes over time, and people have different ideas of, of what they would like the world to be like. And I do think that there's, there's an imagination which maybe technology is going to be able to solve some of you know, our problems, like problems that involve like poverty, lack of housing. Uh, inadequate sanitation, you know, and and one of the places where I am kind of hopeful, you know, and and also doesn't get discussed that much, you know, is the use of artificial intelligence and robotics in construction. You know, uh, you don't see too much here. I think probably China is going to be one of the ones that is going to get there first, but with you know prefabricated parts and with large construction machinery, you might get to a point in the future in which you can have crews that are almost autonomous you know, uh, performing construction, and those could be extremely useful in places that have housing shortages. And there's big parts of the world in which big stocks of housing are inadequate, you know, uh, or that built with light materials, you know, uh, or that built in places, you know, that were not pre-urbanized and therefore the sanitation conditions are really bad and you cannot build sewers once the house is there, you know, it's easier to build the sewers, the street, you know, all of those are utilities before. So for those large, big infrastructure projects that maybe in, in partially like the United States and Europe, we don't think we need because we have decent infrastructure here, but in our parts of the world, we do. This type of technologies might make a big difference, you know, and I do think that a world in which construction machinery can have a big component that is automated might unlock some possibilities of planning and design that at the moment are not available. Okay, thank you. So do we have a other questions at the moment? Okay, so so um, I have a question uh, to Caesar just to follow on this uh, topic. So we saw that in the survey, just uh, one person said that uh, one uh, that artificial intelligence is going to transform public policy and governance. But uh, from the discussion that we have up to now, we can see that actually this is going to have a big impact on uh, governance and economic policies. So I do see a few places, you know, that are very different where artificial intelligence can effect, uh, affect, you know, um, the public sector. On the one hand, on the executive side, 
I do see an opportunity for artificial intelligence to have an impact and it's already having some of that impact and we've done projects on that space. What do I mean by on the executive side? So on the executive side, basically, you know, uh, you have budgets that you have to execute, you know, in agreement, you know, to uh, like, like public policy, but you have a lot of discretion on how you allocate those budgets, okay? Uh, so for instance, recently we did a project in a country of Latin America uh, in which we grab data about, you know, health and about hospital infrastructure to try to identify gaps in public investment in hospitals so that they could better allocate you know, their public investment. And this is a simple machine learning type of approach or algorithm, but it's the idea that when you're dealing at a country scale and you're dealing with so many people and an infrastructure that is so large and that no bureaucrat is able to know, you need this type of augmentation tools to basically identify those, those gaps that you might not otherwise you know, be aware of and to be able to do those budget allocations. Similarly, when it comes to uh, innovation, you know, and, and economic development and, and regional development promotion, uh, Europe now requires all regions to provide a smart specialization strategy that they have to produce every three years, um, and they have to produce that report, but it doesn't tell them how to do it. You know, so what is happening now is that across Europe, many people are starting to use the tools of relatedness and economic complexity to create that smart specialization strategy because that's a way to basically grab the regional specialization of you know, that, that economy and use it to anticipate what's the probability that you would be likely to succeed at certain activity, what is the potential value of that activity. And that's, again, a recommender system like, like the one that Dana was telling us about you know, in the case of Netflix, but applied to regional economic diversification and development. But again, you know, these are not democratic processes. These are executive decisions that in the context that an executive has, you know, basically to distribute some resource, you know, in a way that is much more granular than the one that is told how to, you know, distribute. Now, there is another space, you know, which we can talk about later if you want, but would be on the use of artificial intelligence now on democratic institutions. And that's very different than the one for the executive. I think the executive side, it might happen even without people knowing about it. The other one, you know, I think it's, it's much more controversial, you know, but also much more interesting maybe. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Jean-François, let me ask a question to you. So, oh, we, ha we have a question, do we have a question? From okay, so, so, okay, I have a question uh, for you then. Okay, so you recently worked on artificial intelligence corrupting our morals. How would that work? Well, we, uh, okay, first, in that case, you, you have to start from the baseline, which is how do humans corrupt the morals of other humans? Which means that, uh, that uh, we have different uh, frameworks to think about that. You could have people who are uh, role models. So you see another humans doing something bad and you imitate that person. You could have another human giving you some advice that is bad advice that makes you do something uh, evil. Or you could delegate an evil action to another human and so on. So the thing is, though, we have to trans transpose that to the world of machines. So imagine that you see a machine doing something that is evil. I guess many, many people were very uh, outraged uh, by uh, the episode known as uh, Twitter type, which is the, the, the day where a Twitter bot was exposed to was deployed on Twitter to interact with people and started repeating uh, racist, sexist things that people were saying online. And many people were outraged and thought that if this bot is saying these things, other people are going to see that and be influenced by that. So that would be the role model issues. But then of course, you also have an, an AI might give you advice that is unethical uh, for some reason, and you would then you know, just follow it without realizing. But I think in our paper, we basically said that these two things are unlikely to happen for behavioral reasons. But the last one, which is delegating something you know to be evil or unethical to a machine might be a real threat. That is that people might feel that it's okay to actually delegate the dirty work to a machine and feel, still feel good about themselves, have plausible deniability about what it tells, what it says about them as a person, because that's a very 
there's a very strong motivation for people to act ethically. That is that they don't like to think of themselves as bad persons. So if they have a way to have plausible deniability about their character by delegating the dirty work to a machine, then that's actually apparently uh, a serious risk. Okay. But in some sense, if I understand it well, it's not my area of, of work, so maybe in some sense, this contradicts what Cesar says in terms of humans, huge machines, right? Because if there is an accident and this accident was uh, produced for, for, uh, for a machine, so people is catching more than if it's by a person. So that contradicts uh, the, uh, the thing that people choose a machine to do a thing or not. So in that case, you have to imagine that the outcome is probably good. It's, it's, it's obtain, obtained by unethical means, but it's good. Let's say that you delegate investment to an algorithm and the algorithm you, know, you suspect is using uh, privileged information that is taking from somewhere. And the outcome is actually positive. You're making more money. So in that case, you know, you don't have the bad judgments uh, from a bad outcome generated by machine because the outcome is good, but the means are unethical and you would not do it yourself because you would know this is not supposed to happen. But, you know, if you just suspect that the machine is doing it, but you have no evidence, then, you know, fine. So I'm using that, I mean, in your opinion, uh, machines should have rights, maybe, and the thing that, what, because one of the topics in ethics in artificial intelligence is whether the robots or machines should have rights or not. So if, for example, there is a self-driving car and crash, okay, what happened with this machine? So do you think that maybe the existence of rights in machines should change, for example, the results you obtain in terms of ethics or so on, or not? No, but I can follow up, you know. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not really seeing that, uh, for example, in this example, like the car crashes, why would we want the machine to have rights? I mean, in that case, the problem is the responsibility gap, I think that you're, you're explaining. You know, who is responsible for what's going on? And uh, it seems a very uh, dangerous idea to say that uh, the machine is responsible because then the bucket stops, you know, <laughs> the responsibility just stops there and uh, the car probably doesn't have a bank account to compensate the victims. The car cannot be jailed or punished. So of course we wanna say the responsibility should move on uh, higher in the chain to the people who designed the car, or the people who allowed the car in the market, or someone, some human at some point. And I think many people are saying that this idea of machines having rights uh, has a dangerous effect of making the responsibility bucket stop at the machine. If, if I can add a little bit, so you know, and I agree that machines you know, are, are very far, you know, and, and probably might never have rights as, as humans have rights, but the rights over a lot of things, you know, and I think it's important to look at that nuance. So um, I don't think, for example, a machine anytime soon is going to have a right to life. But I do believe that, for example, when it comes to copyrights, there might be ideas in which you might want to have a machine that produces something. If that something gets used by someone else, there might be some royalty that gets paid back, you know, and, you know, uh, if that thing that the machine produces used as another by another machine as input, you might have kind of like chains of copyrights, you know, that are used to compensate creators and teams along, you know, those lines, you know. So when it comes to rights, you know, there's such a big space of possible rights, you know, property rights vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, fundamental human rights that <clears throat> I think we have to discuss them more individually. And, and that's, you know, one of the ways in which we might be able to get to more precise answers. Oh, yeah, sure. So, okay, so finally, uh, Dana, also, uh, I wanted to, to ask you, so you have worked a lot on uh, algorithmic uh, game theory and uh, pricing. Could you provide us uh, some example of, of uh, where um, algorithmic pricing is used? Yeah, so again, it's, 
I mean, pricing is another example where we can use artificial intelligence to learn about people. So um, if we think about pricing, we think about a company who try to fix uh, an optimal price for their products. So of course, if I'm the company and I want to sell this water and I know that you, your willingness to pay for this water is 10, 10 euros, I will say, okay, this water is 10 euros because I know that it is the value you have for the water. The thing is that first, we don't know the valuation of people for products um, because even if I ask you first, you don't have ins an incentive to tell me the, the right. So, and on the other thing is that even if I know all these values, I can do discrimination. So there is one, very studied topic that is discrimination pricing. And it's basically, it's unfair and it's illegal to do discrimination just because I know that you can pay and you want this water and you are able to pay more. So um, there are a lot of uh, studies and a lot of things to do about that. So we basically we can model this problem as an optimization problem. It's a problem in mechanism design where basically you want to maximize the revenue of the company, but you take into account some equilibrium constraints that measure that the, cons the consumers are also maximizing their utility basically. So if you know that today the water is 10 euros, but tomorrow will be one at one euro, probably you will wait and you will um, buy tomorrow. So there are a lot of constraints, are a lot of things that we have to take into account to, to determine the, the optimal pricing policy. And artificial intelligence helps to predict or, or to, to learn this willingness to pay of people. So this is one parameter, one value that it's really difficult in economics to, to learn. So having historical data and being able to learn about this historical data uh, allows to put people in different clusters saying, okay, people in this cluster maybe and is um, able to pay this amount for this product, people in this other uh, cluster, another pricing. So in, based on that, is that um, a, a pricing policy is made. And for example, in terms of discrimination, because companies cannot do uh, discrimination, uh, what they do is to do it without saying that they are doing discrimination. For example, uh, airlines companies, when you have different prices for the same seats, basically in some sense, that is discrimination saying, okay, um, this is the same seat, but now I'm saying that this is a business class. So you have to pay three times the value and maybe you would pay yesterday for the same seat. So yeah, there are many uh, problems in pricing and artificial intelligence can help in these problems, basically learning about how people uh, um, think and how, uh, how people um, evaluate different products. Okay. And uh, can also consumers behave strategically towards an algorithm, a pricing algorithm? The consumers? Yes. Of course, if, if I am a consumer and I say, okay, I will use all my knowledge about artificial intelligence or, or the algorithms to try to do the same strategy as them, I can learn about their strategy and then I can, in, this is the case where basically consumers are completely rational. This is the definition of being rational in economics, basically. I can learn and I can, yeah, I can guess which is uh, happening in future. And based on that, I will do the best for me. So I think, yes, it takes time, but as, uh, for example, with tickets uh, for flights, uh, we can learn about data because we know that price are dynamics and we don't know if tomorrow the price will be the same or not. But we know more or less that in some 
dates, the, the price are, are higher, or if you want to buy a ticket and you try to buy it one day um, before, and um, would be really high price. So basically, if you use these uh, platforms to compare pricing, uh, prices on an airline, and you have like uh, a good algorithm and a lot of um, data and good data, of course, you can also um, develop an algorithm as maxim maximizing your, your, your utility. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, we have uh, a question from uh, uh, Mohamed. So um, uh, he says, uh, I think you have answered the questions in Zoom. Uh, no? Okay, sorry. No, that's not definitely the question. Uh, I cannot. Ah, so the question is uh, over there. Okay, so we have all seen uh, how Africa is transforming itself through digitalization. A concrete example is uh, mobile banking, which has allowed the creation of new opportunities and the monetization of applications. How do you think Africa can take advantage of artificial intelligence and boost this digital transformation? Anyone can take the question? I guess someone has to bite the bullet, no? So I'll, <laughs> I'll start, you know, and, and please, Jean-François, Dina, you know, join me, you know. Um, so I, I agree that Africa did a great job at developing mobile banking, which is something that a lot of other places have tried to, to achieve. I, in the US, I met all of these entrepreneurs, you know, that have been developing mobile banking and said like in five years, you know, like we're, we're gonna basically displace all banks and, and it didn't happen. It never, it never caught on. And even the forms of mobile payments that, that exist, like the Apple Pay, they're not as popular as like the, the good old plastic credit card that, that gets used a lot in the United States and here in Europe as well. Um, so that was a, a, a big change. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, is this an opportunity for, for Africa? Does it have the same type of conditions you know, for leapfrogging that mobile banking had? Uh, my intuition, and here I'm going out on a limb, is that it might not be the same. You know, In the case of mobile banking, there was a population that was unbanked, that was growing in terms of income, and there was a cheap and accessible technology like the mobile phone that could be used to provide banking service to, to that population. You know? Now, when it comes to the development of artificial intelligence, you know, it's not it's something that you are able to do so much in, in kind of like that distributed context in which you, know, uh, you are satisfying a consumer need with a low cost you know, uh, product, like in the case of mobile banking. Um, a lot of the artificial intelligence that we see right now is being produced in, in very you know, centralized, big efforts. You know, when you look at GPT-3, like these big language models, you know, it's really hard to compete. If you're a person that is working on, on, on natural language generation, you, know, you, you are basically in, in a university uh, unable to compete with GPT-3 and BERT and all of these big models because you don't have the engineering team, you don't have the computing, but those models are very exportable, you know, meaning that through an API, you can interact with them, and therefore the transportation cost is very low, so you train them once and many people can use them and that generates a very different economic geography than the one of mobile banking. You know? Of course, there might be opportunities to maybe develop applications and, and exploit that very fluid economic geography in the case of Africa. But I think that the, the, the geography, at least of, of creating this organization, like creating a mobile banking company, you know, in which the advantage is having locally unbanked clients and creating an AI company in which the advantage is not so much on that demand side, but more on having a real advantage on the supply side in an economic geography of low transportation cost and high value are very different. Thank you. So, okay, so, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, read it. Uh, can you? Uh... Paul Melky? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, uh, so Paul asked us to talk about the black box effect, you know, uh, basically he's saying that if we judge humans based on intentions and machines based on output, is that because of you know, the black box effect? Is because machines cannot explain themselves. So I, I, I'm sure Jean-Francois has a lot to say there. Uh, I'm gonna just mention one paper that I like a lot, uh, a paper by Berkeley Dietborst, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, which is about algorithm aversion. And basically in that paper, what they, what they do is they give 
you know, people with a certain amount of money that they can decide to invest with a human financial advisor or with a machine financial advisor. And at the end of the experiment, they get to take the money back home. So there's kind of like an incentive to try to maximize your bets, you know, to, to basically uh, do wise investments. Now, what they find is that people prefer the human financial advisor, but then they have a condition in which the human financial advisor is paired not just with a machine financial advisor, but they're also showing the picks that this machine financial advisor made. You know? And then they're sort of opening the black box. They're not just saying this financial advisor is giving you 7% return. You know, saying like, look, this financial advisor you know, bought Tesla at this price, sold it at that price and whatnot. And what, what they find is that people avoid the machine even more after they see the machine or after they see the picks, you know? So as people would, would be kind of like over-interpreting the mistakes of the machine and they don't feel so identified, you know? So when you open the black box, at least that paper, of course, opening the black box in terms of explainability can mean a lot of different things, you know? That's a very narrow example. But still in that example, you see the opposite of what you expect based on that intuition. You don't see people becoming more trusting of the machine, but people over-interpreting their mistakes and say, I wouldn't have been so stupid to sold Tesla at $500. Maybe you sold at $400. No, so, <laughs> exactly. So that's that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for introducing <laughs> that paper uh, so I can go straight <laughs> to the follow-up. So yeah, uh, I think we have to look at the black box and the outcome. But first say that, okay, when, you, when we say that that, for example, people are less forgiving of machines mistake than human mistake. I mean, you can see the logic, right? Uh, we know that there is variance in human performance. You know, we, we don't expect people to deliver every day the same, well, like machines. So, uh, so when someone makes a mistake, we know that yes, many things could have happened and we're not quick to judge that the person is incompetent, right? So uh, the problem is that when a machine makes a mistake, we, we don't have the same kind of perception that there's a lot of variance and a lot of reasons why a machine would make mistakes. So it's tempting to just think, well, if the machine is making a mistake, that's because it's uh, badly coded. Whereas we don't say that, oh, this human made a mistake once, their brain is badly coded and I'm not gonna trust them. So we give some slack to humans, we give less slack to machines. But then there's also uh, the problem that in, indeed uh, the black spot problem is that the thought process of machines are uh, opaque to us. Again, it's always nice to go back to the baseline and to say our human thought process so transparent to us because I've been a psychologist for 20 years and for the most part, humans are still back boxes to me. You know, so uh, I, I don't want to over, you know, to, to over emphasize the understanding that we have about uh, how humans decide. But yes, uh, at least we have at least the illusion that we understand uh, what other people think and how they decide. And but we don't have that for machines. And that was very striking to me when, for example, there was this very highly publicized uh, car crash in Tempe, Arizona, where uh, an a Uber vehicle with a safety driver crashed and killed a pedestrian. And in the days after the crash, uh, you know, a lot of information came up. Like, okay, uh, the car uh, perhaps had issues with identifying the object, well, the human on the road, but then the safety driver was distracted and was watching the voice on her iPhone during the ride. And the, the pedestrian was crossing a highway at night in the dark and outside of a crossroad. And so you would see that, okay, it's a very complicated situation, but what you saw that is that everyone, everyone jumped at the human responsibility either the safety driver or the pedestrian for the first few days. And you can understand that. I have no idea how a car thinks. I have a pretty good idea that uh, yes, not watching the road if you're the safety driver is bad, that crossing the road at night uh, is not so smart, but the machine, I don't know. So in that case, you would think that, okay, giving more information about how the machine perceived the road and so on would change people's mind. And it did to a certain extent because there were explanations about the mistakes that the machine did. But uh, these explanations, they're always very imperfect, very crude. Sometimes I compare 
uh, explaining a machine thought process uh, with visualizing a complex data set. You know, you, the, 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 the figure, the, figure the, the, the infographic you make from a complex data set is never the exact truth. It's just a way you have to frame and emphasize some aspect of the data set. So there's like a persuasive component to it. Sometimes you sacrifice a bit of accuracy or, or a bit of granularity to make you know, your message more compelling. And I'm afraid this is what we are condemned to do when we want to explain a complex algorithm. We will never get rid of the persuasive component. You know, we will never be able to give a neutrally framed explanation of what was going, what is going to, what's going to happen. And I don't see how we're going to solve this. All our efforts toward explainability are always going to hit that wall that if people realize that there's always a persuasive component to the way you explain a machine, they will never trust completely what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. Last question uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, Is uh, the first one the one on the top? The one on the top. Okay. That. Uh, uh, so, from a cybersecurity point of view, which uh, what kind of attack can be expected to artificial intelligence-based system? How disruptive could it be, and how could it be prevented? So. I'm just a humble psychologist, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, that's definitely also very far from my area of expertise, but I, I, I met some people that, you know, have been working on this uh, along the path. And uh, of course, we all know about these adversarial attacks. You know, we know these attacks in which sometimes you change a little bit of a stop sign and the machine, you know, interprets it as a duck or whatever, something different. The point is that, you know, you can fool the machine in a way that you will never be able to fool a human because the way that the machine is interpreting the input, you know, because of that obscurity, you know, sometimes it's not very robust, you know? So there's a lot of these adversarial attacks and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a great thing. I think that's the evolutionary pressure that you want, you know, on the development of those algorithms, on the, you know, training data that you're gonna use and, and, and whatnot. And for instance, here in Anity, a lot of people have been doing great advances at developing AI that is more robust by combining these statistical learning models that sometimes can be very good at the scalability and speed and performance and all of that. But, you know, all of a sudden there's some corner cases in which they make really stupid mistakes with AI based systems that are based more on symbolic logic. And that in some sense, you cannot fool in the way that you might be able to fool a system that is trained and you don't know that much what's going on inside the neural network. So, so you know, there are attacks that you can do by providing input that can fool the machine. But there's also a lot of effort to create these robust algorithms, you know, and some of them involve this symbolic logic. Some of them also involve mimicking some sort of feedback structures, you know, that are able to denoise, you know, uh, the input as it moves, you know, throughout the layers of, of, a, of a deep learning system. So I think this is a very interesting, you know, question because we are kind of at, at that space in which uh, the technology was developed, the mistakes were understood. And now we're starting to figure out how to create a technology that is robust to those mistakes. Thank you. So, so it's almost uh, 6 uh, p.m. Thank you all uh, for uh, coming. Before uh, we round up uh, the discussion, we would like to present our latest IST magazine with a special focus on artificial intelligence and the IST 10th uh, anniversary. Okay, so... Um, we have now come to an end of today's uh, event. Uh, thank you, Jean-Francois, Cesar, and Dana for coming and for sharing your expertise with us and for sharing for answering so many questions. And uh, thank you very much to the audience for being uh, with us and for uh, participating via your questions. So if you're interested in our research, please visit uh, our website. Uh, the link should appear in the chat right now. And uh, follow us on our social networks, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter to stay updated with the upcoming events. Thank you all for coming and have a great evening. <laughs>